It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedback day of the week. Ha. And it's Feedback Friday, and I'm here with Momo. Hi, Momo. Hi. Yeah. Momo's feeling much better. I gave uh, the patrons a full Momo health report um, because so many people were asking. <laughs> He's very happy right now. If you want to get updates on Momo, and the other furballs help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Otherwise, you can just watch him crawl all over me while I record this because he hugged everybody at the vet two days ago. And ever since, he's just been like super love me, love me, love me, love is good, right? Because you're feeling better, eh, buddy? It took a long time. Yeah, I'm almost happy. But um, a, an issue came up, uh, uh, not an issue, a topic came up on the Twitch stream on Tuesday night, and uh, it was really ironic timing because what the heck's wrong with my lip? I'll have to check that later. But hello, Mumu. Um, but uh, it was really ironic timing because it was about the Sony censorship stuff, and I said at the time that um, I hadn't commented on it because there weren't any firm known knowns. And sure enough, no sooner did I say that than the Wall Street Journal dropped a major article um, about Sony censorship and some of the reasons for it. And the article's filled with a lot of speculations and um, uh, external sources that a lot of the um, coverage and a lot of the things people told me about it. You done, Momo? Okay. Um, a lot of things people told me about it. People were confusing comments made by third parties in the article with comments that Sony itself made. And uh, that's led to a lot of confusion as to why um, Sony made the decision it made. Um, anybody that's been following Sony for any length of time knows it's a very conservative company. Um, they do not make sudden moves uh, very often. And so that's why any change in the way they do business is very notable. Um, and uh, the, I think the big thing that um, made this a big deal was that developer, I'm going to, I'm going to mispronounce it so that Senran Kurgara or something like that game, I don't play them, but the developer quit saying that he basically, he was, he was big about it. He was really classy about it, but he uh, said he quit because he couldn't make the game he wanted to make anymore and distribute it on the PlayStation platform. Now, I'll show you the, uh, the article here so that you can actually see it instead of just taking my word for it. Oh, that's odd. Oh, that took a moment. Um, but uh, sorry, I switched over to my... Uh, my monitor capture and it was black for a minute. That was weird. But so here we go. This is the original Wall Street Journal article that everybody else has been quoting. Um, Sony cracks down on sexually explicit content in games. What just happened here? Oh God, my, uh, the video that I've been uh, downloading from Twitch just popped up. That's really funny. Uh, good timing. Um, so, you see, Sony Corporation is cracking down on sexual content in PlayStation 4 video games globally, reflecting concerns in the U.S. about the depiction of women in games, but also irritating some software developers. New in-house standards that limit sexually explicit content distinguish Sony from other game hardware makers that allow more leeway as long as the software carries a rating from a national industry body. Sony spokeswoman... A Sony spokeswoman said the company has established its own guidelines so that creators can offer well-balanced content on the platform and gaming does not inhibit the sound growth and development of young people. She declined to say when these guidelines were introduced or to discuss them in detail. And a lot of people got upset at that quote. And I contest that quote, likely for the same reasons that people got upset, is that there have there has been absolutely no evidence that games, when played age appropriately, uh, inhibit any development of young people. Uh, young people shouldn't be sorry. I'm just moving the chair because it's bothering me. Um, young people shouldn't be playing adult games, you know, for many reasons, um, you know. And we have a really great system in the ESRB that if parents think their kids are more mature than the average kidlet. 
they can allow their kids to play those games. The the government does not, at least up here in North America, the government does not make the decision for parents, which I think is correct. But there has been no evidence that um, video game content uh, long term impacts attitudes regarding sexism or racism or violence or, or anything like that. It can be too intense for kids and scare them, but that's more about violence, not so much about sex. The The issues with sex in America and increasingly in Canada because of the importation of this American style puritanism through politics um, is not based on any facts. It's not based on any science. It's just based on uh, fear of parents and various so-called educators who don't actually know the facts. And um, this is where Sony being a very conservative company um, comes in. Because I'm sure Sony knows this. They're just tired of fighting it. And this is where, you know, we kind of lose the free speech argument in terms of Sony is a privately held corporation. There is no law prohibiting privately held corporations from censoring anything it wants. Corporations are practically people in the U.S., meaning that they are reserve the right of freedom of speech but also freedom from speech and as a publisher they can refuse to put anything on their platform that they want they withhold they they hold that right so from a legal perspective uh there's nothing anybody can do about this philosophically you can say that um this is wrong and i don't like it I'm giving Sony the benefit of the doubt here because the PlayStation makes them so much money and not wanting trouble from the screamers in gaming. I think, you know, you can kind of understand that perspective. They just don't want the trouble. And as disappointing as this is, I think it's temporary. I think that this this um, sex negative push is just one of these waves. We get them every so often. Um, you know, there there were more cover up um, moments in Western history throughout Western history that pendulum swings. Um, it will swing back eventually. In the meantime, uh, the PS4 made Sony a lot of money. Uh, 94 million units sold around the globe. Go- go- that's sold, not shipped. That's a huge number. $11 billion in PlayStation 4 game software was sold in 2018. Um, it's been one of Sony's pillars in its, um, uh, re- like, its, its turnaround as a company. They played the long game. They invested heavily. And it's, it's paid off for them. They're doing, they're doing very well as a company. Um, and this article says, let me, let me flip to it so you can see it. Don't just take my word for it. Two factors last year combined to turn that NEs into action, these Sony officials say. One was the rise of the Me Too movement in the U.S., which pointed to the dangers of being associated with content that some might see as demeaning to women. Note that phrasing there. Pointed to the dangers of being associated with content that some might see as demeaning to women, not content that is provably demeaning to women. This is about public perception. Okay. The second was the emergence of channels on sites like YouTube and Amazon.com's Inks Twitch, where gamers play in front of a can- camera and are watched by fans online. This means games meeting Japanese laxer standards can readily get worldwide exposure. Sony is concerned the company could become a target of legal and social action, a Sony official in the U.S. said. So to put that in, in simple terms, they're afraid of getting protested and sued, which in this climate is a reasonable concern. And then some person saying, um, uh, in Canada, I've never heard of media smarts. Um, using not science um, to say the move was reasonable given the influence game content can potentially have on players in real life. No, that's not true. So I don't know who this company is, but I'm not giving me any more time. Um, but uh 
executives and developers of, of, at makers of sexually whoops, sexually explicit games say Sony used to praise them as an important part of the PlayStation business strategy because their offerings added to the variety of console games, but that support is faded. Um, basically, and this is what um, I find so interesting about this stuff. Um they, they mentioned some Japan, Japan-based software executives also complained they've been required to communicate in English because Sony's global game business is based in California. It's funny, because when I was in university, this was considered um, post-colonial oppression of the Japanese people, that a Japanese company would be forced to conform to Western norms was considered a bad thing because it was making Western culture global culture. And the argument was that they don't really have a choice in the matter, but to adapt to US norms. And it's true. If you look at the sales, even of Japanese games, like games made in Japan for the Japanese audience, a lot of them outsell um, the Japanese market in America, like three to one. Even these niche games that come from like AA studios and don't have a huge amount of marketing, the the North American um, North American player base is just so huge, and they spend so much on games that you know it's business. I mean, this is this is unfortunately capitalism. If you want to sell, you have to keep the pulse on um, on the way things are going, and they're playing it safe. And I just want to say, to sort of conclude this part, I don't think we should be too hard on Sony here because they're not condoning the attitudes. They're just acknowledging that they are a business reality. And I would say that Sony is more of a victim here of North American puritanism than it is some sort of oppressor. They're doing this because they don't feel like they have a choice and they have to protect their business interests from viewpoints that they don't totally understand. I mean, I personally think the Japanese model has it right. Demystify sex at a younger age, um, make sex seem less bad than violence. And uh, I mean, the, the, the rates that the Japanese are actually having sex is super low. So if consuming sexual content made kids want to go out and have sex, well, Japanese birth rates are kind of a an indication that that's not so so um that's where i'm gonna go there because you asked me to talk about it so i'm talking about it moving on to your comments because that's what feedback that's what feedback friday is supposed to be and i only spent 13 minutes on it so i can blow through this and and stand with a half hour um with the mortal kombat stuff this continues to be a very very um popular video subject um and Gene Gentry again came in with a really good, thoughtful comment that um, I related to a lot, so I'm going to read it here. I find it, generally speaking, that the sincere, as in not trolling for lols, defenders of NRS, NetherRealm Studios, decision to change the costumes are up in their feelings. I think a lot of them sincerely do want to see respectful depictions of women. They just have a very narrow idea of what a respectful depiction is. Also, I have noticed that many of them cite the oversexed designs of MK9, in particular Sexy Cop Sonya, uh, or certain wind poses, such as Jade's pole dance, as indicative of the entire series, completely forgetting that MK10, or MKX, or the entire original series of games exists. They are so insistent on not repeating MK9's designs that they are missing the forest for the trees. When you retort that the art direction is not respectful because it enforces a standard that is not imposed on the male designs, or how the original designs were empowering in their own right, it breaks their brains, so to speak. I think it throws them for a loop to see women defending such immodest, slutty costumes. After after all, it's easy to say that men defend it because they are thinking with their head in their pants. But what about women? How can we defend such a thing? The defenders find the old designs demeaning and objectifying, while we, those male and female gamers who had no issue with the old designs, don't. We found it empowering because we didn't fall in love with the costume. We fell in love with the characters, the waifu effect. For me, Shiva is best girl because she's strong and her outfit's fit is a visual expression of that strength. If Goro and Kintaro can wear skimpy shorts to show off their muscles and look imposing, then Shiva can wear her slinkini for the same effect. Fair is fair. I absolutely agree, though. 
I don't think, based on the comments from these defenders of NetherRealm's uh, decision, I can't say all of them are really interested in being respectful of women. I think they want to control what women do to please them in, in their particular, you know, uh, male opinion. That when you start going, don't dress like sluts, don't dress like strippers, that's be someone I can take home to mom. The thinking there isn't, I want a woman to do what feels best for her and I'm going to respect that decision. The thinking there is, Men get a say and men get the dominant say in what type of attire is appropriate or not appropriate for women to wear. And no matter how you slice that, when you start slut shaming a woman based on the way she dresses, not her actual sexual activity even, which is still like men don't get judged that way. Men do not get called a slut because they sleep around. It's considered the normal state for men. And I don't think that's right either. It puts too much pressure on men to be the sexual aggressor. But I digress. When you are assuming a woman's sexual activity by the way she prefers to dress, that is sexist, period, end of story. You ask a lot of people who, well, why'd you wear shorts that short? And all this stuff is because I was hot and I went to the store and these were the shorts they sold. And it doesn't bother me. I want to be comfortable. It was a hot day. That's what you hear from a lot of these people who get slut shamed. And so there's no way around the fact that the, the way the dialogue has gone surrounding this decision from NetherRealm Studios is profoundly sexist. The only way you can buy what Nether Realms is selling in terms of their explanation for why they made the costume changes is that it's okay for women to be held to a higher standard regarding dress than men. Period. End of story. There is no way around it. And that is sexist. So, Jean, awesome. That just made me think of that one point. Just not I'm saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that my experience with some of these defenders has been, no, they're not coming at it from a good place. Some are. Some are. But some want to control what women look like and what women wear so that men continue, the comfort of men continues to be dominant in gaming. And that is, that is, is that is it's central to this decision that we don't want to get accused of being bad guys. So we're going to defy the history of our game and not just come back to where we were before we went overboard with some of the Mortal Kombat 9 costumes. And I agree that Sonya's outfit in Mortal Kombat 9 was ridiculous. You can't stay in that outfit. She's from our realm. She is a member of the armed services. That was a Halloween costume, not tactical armor. It was foolish. It violated the, the essential character points of Sonya. Um, that's just true. I mean, back when they were doing the original like photograph series that they pixeled over for the original games they just went over what the what the motion capture actresses were, or performers were actually wearing so we didn't have that issue back then when they went to 3d modeling and, and purely like virtual people they did go crazy for a while and i think that i didn't even notice that jade's pole dance was evocative that way i don't know why but i i did think that um uh sonia's um uh, maybe it's because I really respect pole dancing as being really freaking hard and I don't see a problem with it, so it didn't bother me. But Sonya's outfit just made no sense. It it didn't. I didn't think it properly conveyed her character. Um, and they dialed it back in MK10, and that's awesome. But again, instead of saying, we were being ridiculous, and it was too ridiculous, we went overboard they went to, oh, no, we're being respectful now with this huge overcompensation the other way. I, I just can't follow them there. Uh, moving on to the Game of Thrones stuff. This is a really interesting social experiment. The whole idea of a Mary Sue, the idea of Mary Sue's outside of fan fiction continues to confound me because Mary Sue is a colloquialism. It is not an official term. And people fight to the death about whether a character 
is or is not a Mary Sue, but not even that. They fight about the definition of a Mary Sue. And some people insist that the only thing that is required for a character to be a Mary Sue or a Gary Sue or a Marty Sue um, in fiction is that they're too perfect. And I disagree. Having been around when the toy, when the coin when the term was coined based on a character named Mary Sue and I believe it was a Star Trek fan fiction but she was the youngest lieutenant in the fleet or something like that at 17 years old she was clearly an author self-insert clearly an author self-insert clearly wish fulfillment so being a too perfect character is not enough to deem somebody a Mary Sue because of all it takes a character being too perfect then excuse the blasphemy then Jesus is a Marty Stew. He is a perfect character. He has no flaws. Now, my understanding of Mary Sue is that, no, that's canon. So that's fine. One can argue. I'm not going to argue the Bible is badly written. That's a whole kettle of fish I do not want to want to burn myself on. Um, but this is why it's important that we understand that this was a fan fiction term. It was bringing someone in who was a a companion to a canon character and somehow manages to rescue the canon character and and uh, you know it's better than everything and unbalances the story in a certain way hence my discomfort in applying it to things that are not fan fiction the gray area we get into is that now sci-fi and fantasy these continuing saga things these things that borrow from existing works um the way star wars kind of has passed hands in terms of you know it was george lucas and company for the longest time now it's not now there's other people continuing the stories so there is a form of of um fan fiction in it in that it's not the original creator um or something like game of thrones where you know george r, r. martin says that his his most proud claim to fame is that he was the first person to reg register for New York Comic Con ever. He is a fan. Um, one could claim that Game of Thrones is a lot of um, Tolkien fan fiction, reworking the character tropes that Tolkien used to make them better. You know, one could argue that, you know, borrowing from different things as well. Um, I'm not sure that I, I will come down... Um, one way or another on that i think he did do some things that were were unique to his writing but um it, it's it's undeniable that the that samuel tarley is an author self-insert in that work and so it deserves examination and you can't just go no he's not a murder stew because 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 he fails because he this <sighs> obviously you guys have not gone back and read these original Mary Sue fan fictions because those characters do suffer setbacks um, to make them, oh, the world's so unfair. It's totally not their fault. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so it, it's not so cut and dried. The other thing that people got, he studied under Meester, so-and-so, Meister. Um, yeah, watching somebody do difficult surgery and actually practicing, they never showed him actually practicing the surgery on the show. So it still fits. It's the exact same thing that people complained about Rey in Star Wars. We did not see the training Therefore, she is overpowered. She is too good at what she does. And I find it so interesting that people were so busy arguing um, Sam wasn't a Marty Stu that they missed that I misspelled his name in the thumbnail. Somebody on Twitch said, did it? How many people gave you a hard time for misspelling his name in the thumbnail? And I said, almost no one at the time, which is pretty funny. Um, that's when you know people are knee jerking and and coming at it from an emotional place which i continue to find interesting i found the responses to uh sansa stark very interesting too um for a different reason a lot of people were like oh god it's not just me and what was funny is that youtube played a ad for game of thrones the game um 
fe heavily featuring Sansa Stark, which shows that YouTube algorithms are still not much better than keyword searches, which is funny. Um, because you'd think that the Game of Thrones game makers would not want their ad on a video criticizing a character they're showing prominently. There you go. Um, there were a lot of f fights about whether or not Sansa is smart and Arya's comment that um, Sansa's the smartest person she knows. Um, they could have done a better job showing Sansa starts smarts more frequently the way they do with Tyrion. Um, though they, they did show that she was smart enough to sort of outsmart Littlefinger. Um, so she did display some smarts as, as she grew up after she'd suffered a lot of adversity. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to say the character isn't smart. The fact that Arya said that Sansa's the smartest person she knows, I took that as her just being defensive of her sister. She's finally home. They're finally somewhat reunited. Arya wants to stop the fighting. And so she got, um, um, uh, she got defensive. That's how I took it. So, uh, but people really had a problem with that line because it, it was very much, and a lot of people made this comment, it was very much tell, not showing. And that is a writing weakness. There's, there's, no, um, there, there's no denying um, that there's a, a writing weakness uh, regarding Game of Thrones where there's a lot of telling and not a lot of showing. And I think that's people just being a little too fanboy or fangirly from the text. Because in a text, uh, characters making statements about somebody's virtues... Um, it's a part of Game of Thrones. You can't you can't see things in the same one a page as you can when it's acted. So I think that's just a bit of a failure to um, adapt to the screen. So, uh, somebody said they wanted a rant on Daenerys, which is really interesting, um, because I agree that that they said uh, the most entitled, unqualified leader I've ever seen. Um, I don't think she's the most unqualified leader, even on Game of Thrones. I, I think that that uh, goes to Joffrey and and maybe Tomlin. Um, but uh, Daenerys certainly has some flaws. The question is, are those flaws deliberate? I think the jury's still out in that regard. So we'll see how it goes with Daenerys. If they if they fall off that balance, you have my promise now. I will do a Daenerys rant if the character all of a sudden falls off that razor's edge she's balanced on. So you have that guarantee from me right now. And uh, that's probably a good way to wrap up because I've done all the, I've done all the recaps. Yay. And um, Twitch is going really well. It's just really exhausting. But that's because um, I've been playing Sekiro, which is a really hard game. And and the people who watch Twitch, the, the people who follow regularly, we're going to start mixing it up. I'm going to start doing um, new games, going back to sort of the ad adventure um, adventure format. I'm going to do on Tuesday a game called Danielle's Inferno. Yes, that is a cat. Uh, the cat is part of it. Danielle's Inferno is, uh, the cat's name is Pudding, and um, it's a spoof on Dante's Inferno in corporate hell. So tune in on Tuesday. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do Danielle's Inferno, and then I'm gonna keep doing Sekiro on Thursdays, just because I kind of find it fun. But people in the chat said they miss me being tuned into the chat and commenting and and doing the more hosting role because I have to concentrate so much on um, the bosses and the various gameplay in in Sekiro. So we'll do the best of both worlds um, and see how that goes. Um, all right, everybody. Until then. Once again, help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com slash Leanna K. Um, there's been a big uptick uh, in patron support lately. I really appreciate that greatly. And pretty soon, pretty soon, we are going to start gearing up for boss fight. My uh, next Kickstarter, I have to get the remaining lady bits backer packages out with a few exceptions because of special shipping requests. But um, I, I want to get the vast majority of them, the non-exceptions ones out. I want to 
finish Lady Bits before I start crowdfunding another one. But I do want to start teasing it so you guys know what's going on and we can really hit the ground running. So you're completely prepared for what kind of incentives to expect, um, what it's going to be. So you are totally informed. So we can do the same thing with Lady Bits and fund it in like a matter of days. Um, you know, the, the preliminary funding, because that'd be really great. That's really great momentum. Um, and uh, that would be cool. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a great weekend. See you on Monday.